Dream Hand study. It's also, I should say, it's age related. We have more of it when we're young, and it gets less as we age. Like if you, I can take you into our lab and record your HRV and tell within about two years how old you are, unless you're on an unhealthy, got a lot, a lot of stress in your life or gone through some trauma or something, and be, then you're basically aging faster physiologically than you are chronologically. Okay, it's also an important indicator of psychological resiliency, our ability to adapt to stress. Kind of in the other part we were just talking about. If we lose that variability, we, we're not as flexible. We're not able to, uh, not just physically, but we're not able to adapt to different contexts in life, stress. More it, recent work, a lot of what our work has been, and a, a lot of other groups are now starting to also get into and, and uh, verify is that there is a direct relationship between the heart's variability, and rhythm, and cognitive function. So if you have two of you the same age, and one of you has higher variability than the other, the one with the higher variability is more than likely going to do better on <coughs> cognitive tasks, going to be better at making decisions, going to have faster reaction times, and so on. Let me one clarify on variability. That's within a very limited window. We're talking within seconds, not within. Oh, well, over time. No, it can be over time. Yeah, but the variability you're measuring is um, like within five seconds, you have a few measures of variability. It's not like. Minute one, it was this, and then minute two. Yeah, actually, is we measure each every heartbeat for. Every we do it over 24 hours, actually, for, for well, clinically. What you're measuring is beat to beat almost. It is beat to beat. It is beat to beat. Yeah, but then we look at that to, to say how much variability somebody has. To really assess that, we do it over 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. So this is actual variability. What it really looks like. This is real data. Um, so these two graphs are from the same person. It's a pretty controlled study in this that these are from. Uh, and and we, we used to have a lot of fun in the lab manipulating people's emotions yeah. and finding new creative ways to do that. You had a so you, yeah, when you say you measure that over 24 hours, you mm -hmm. measure them in the lab? Still? No, no, no. We have ambulatory devices they wear. But then it depends a lot on what they're doing sure during does. the day. Yeah, but it, it averages out over a day. You know, that's, that's what we want is ambulatory. That's a whole other lecture. but. Uh, Mm. Happy to give it sometime. Um, but the, cl the clinical assessment is used to be done from Holter recorders. We have really neat new equipment now, weighs half an ounce that records actually a week's worth of data if you want to. So does that mean that the people who are more active have therefore a higher variability? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because it kind of averages out over that 24 hour period. Uh, um, if I go too into that right now, I'm going to. I'm happy to maybe have a discussion with you on it, too. I actually wrote a little booklet on it. Anyway, same person. So on the top graph, uh, we got him frustrated, basically, obviously, from the label. And what you find is basically when, you get, when you're irritated, frustrated, these so-called negative emotions. I mean, I call them negative because of the impact they have on our body, this negative impact. Uh, you see this kind of chaotic, jagged-looking rhythm. That's much more chaotic-looking than a normal resting or even moving around rhythm. So what this is reflecting is a desynchronization between the two branches of the nervous system. Think of it like driving a car with one foot on the accelerator and the other foot on the brake at the same time. OK, and not a lot of coordination between the two. Now, why is that not a good idea to drive your car that way? Come on, you have to participate now. That's yeah, you're going to put a lot more stress on that. What else, though? That's a great example. Yeah, you're going to stress all the parts, right? You're all those. But what else other than wearing out and the... the you may not get anywhere. <laughs> well, it's going to be probably a jerky ride. Yeah. What about your gas mileage? Mm. You're going to frustrate other drivers. Yeah, right. But you're really burning energy, okay. right? I mean, you're wasting a lot of energy. These, these, all of these same things are true in terms of our physiological systems. It's a great analogy. So we're out of sync, OK? Remember the heart sending all this information back up to the brain? That is a rhythm that's associated with what's called cortical inhibitions, the technical name. Basically inhibits brain function. And the term cortical inhibitions, the technical term, was, was coined back in the 70s, way before my time. We're doing this kind of research. So this is not a new concept. Same person shifting into what we call now call a coherent state. We call this incoherent. We call this coherent. In this particular series of studies, the only manipulation was having them shift emotional state, where they were sincerely appreciating 
caring, feeling compassionate. Okay, and I, it's important to note that this was independent of breathing. Okay, so emotion that actually drives will cause changes in breathing, for example, that, that's well established. Uh, but, but we can also use breathing to help, once you identify the state, get you into that coherent state. So here the, the nervous system's in sync, the activity in our system's in sync. So you've got high variability, that's what I mean by a good variability, the, kind of the range of it, but it's ordered over time. So, so remember, just from, go, go from one sort of cycle here is probably 15 heartbeats. Any, any questions about this? Is this all making sense? Yeah. yeah. So when you talk about beating in the heart rate, would you say then it's sort of a perpetual cycle in the sense that when you're relaxed, your beating becomes more relaxed, therefore you're more relaxed, when you're stressed, yeah, harder. right, but this isn't all, there is actually other inputs into this than just breathing, okay. even though breathing is an important one. So what's the second major sort of change, right? Well, uh, it's the synchronized activity in the nervous system is, is like a really big factor. And this is the subcortical structures then? Also, yeah, know? yeah, but also modulated down from, from cortical, yeah. Uh, important point about incoherent, the difference between well, which one of these has the most amount of variability, do you think? The top one or the bottom one? Bottom. bottom? Anybody want to argue with that? God, you're a quiet group. Oh, it's just quiet? No, no, but, but I, I think we guess the answer from ahead because uh, we know the bottom's going to be better. Nah. No, we're wrong? You're wrong. We're wrong. The amount of variability, it's a trick question. Okay. Because the amount of variability in these oh. two graphs is identical to two decimal places. Okay, but more variability is good, right? Less variability is bad. That's true, but that's measured over a long time period, and it takes a long time to get lowered variability for our age. You know, it's accumulated stress, right? Wear and tear. So that's so. Think of the amount of variability, age-related amount of amount of variability, as reflecting kind of your resiliency, or your capacity, your vitality. But what is it? So if the amount's the same, what's different here? Come on, you're a sharp class. What? Consistency. Consistency, yeah, the pattern, basically. Yeah. Right, so this was kind of a, a, an important observation that nobody had kind of gotten onto first. In fact, so if you did a study and you were looking for changes in amount of variability, which a lot of people still do, and you were saying, okay, we're going to get some people all calm and caring and all that, and we're going to get some other ones frustrated and angry, and you're just looking for changes in amount of variability, you'd come away with no difference. Doesn't matter if we're all pissed off or if we're caring and loving in terms of an autonomic function, right? In fact, some studies have done that and come along with that conclusion. But I'm suggesting, no, no, there's something very different going on here. So you said something important and you cut away from us. The pattern of variability change that wasn't understood until... Oh, uh, we got into this kind of... Got we're it. the ones that the fir first that. reported this, yeah. Chris. Yeah, back in the early 90s. Okay, got it. Yeah. So in other words, the pattern is reflecting emotional state in real time. So it's state specific. Does that make sense to you guys? So there's a big difference between amount of variability and pattern. Now pattern, this pattern information, another important point here, is independent of how much variability, and even more importantly, it's independent of heart rate. Now, why would that be an important point? Because a lot of health will just focus on reducing the heart rate. Yes. Rate right. So when you're talking, most people think about stress regulation or all that is to be something to do with relaxation. And that's, of course, a relaxation is an important skill. Of course. However, if you're, uh, we do a lot of work with the military, police departments, right, EMTs, things like that. The last thing you want them to do is to be overly relaxed low heart rate. That actually, low relaxation in some contexts actually reduces performance. Kind of obvious probably, right? Some things you need a high heart rate for. If you're a, a, an athlete, for example, right? But you can, so you can be in either in an incoherent or a coherent state at almost any heart rate. In fact, a lot of our folks working in the military, I've got people be able to maintain coherent states with heart rates up to 120 now. Takes some practice. Right, so kind of with coherence, I didn't say it, but it's sort of obviously that's facilitating brain function, cortical so function. You or someone picked the word coherence to describe uh, an optimal pattern of variability. Yeah. Why right. coherence? That's the word. Ah, well, okay. 
We took, my scientific advisory board took two years to agree on a term, and this was people like Carl Prebram, uh, we were talking about at lunch, who's the, considered the father of cognitive modern neuroscience. He was head of brain research here at Stanford for 30 years. Don Singer was a part of this. Uh, he's a cardiologist who coined the term heart rate variability. I mean, a whole, had a room full of people of that stature arguing about it. It was an important decision. decision. It was an important decision. It wasn't it's trivial. That <laughs> it wasn't trivial. Um, so, well, if you look up coherence in the dictionary, first definition is usually uh, as in a coherent sentence, mm -hmm. right? And if you're uttering meaningless nonsense, that's incoherent. So do all the words hold together in a way that the meaning of the sentence conveys more than the individual meaning of the words? Mm -hmm. That's a coherent sentence. Then in physics, coherence is used in two primary ways. One is in what's called auto coherent. You add auto to mean a coherent system is a single waveform. Ideal uh, example of coherence is a sine wave, non-varying in time and frequency. The other way it's used in physics is cross coherence. So you've got multiple systems like a laser where the photons are all in sync, phase and frequency locked. So that's another type of coherence. All of those are true in physiology. So as, as we're more coherent mentally and emotionally, you know, more together, <laughs> right, making sense, that is uh, impacting our physiology into incoherent or coherent, co-varying ways. Then the coherence also allows us, is a term that also lets us talk about social relationships. Do you have coherent, in other words, coherence always implies harmony, connectedness, interconnectedness, and energy, uh, efficient util energy utilization. So that was part of all that went into that discussion. So yeah. the coherent signals, does the frequency in which they're occurring matter? I'm sorry? Does the frequency matter? Let's say you have the same sort of coherence within the bottom signal, but you had a higher frequency. Well, it would still be coherent at a higher frequency, right, right, but yeah. Would that have any implications with stress? And yeah, it, well, in terms of physiology, this is, the co this is the resonant frequency of the human system. Okay, so there's just like a single frequency. Yeah, it, it's a bell curve, of course, but the, the mm -hmm. resonant frequency, if you take a few hundred people, or thousands as we did in our case, and look at the resonant frequency, the center of the bell curve is 0 0.1 hertz. So it's a 10 second rhythm. Exactly? Yeah. Wow. And what's really fascinating is just uh, a lot of animals have the exact same resonant frequency. I mean, it blows me away that a mouse and a monkey and a, a dog have the same basic resonant frequency. Because you, you have huge different orders of scale, but still that's, that, that, that is maintained. Okay, so we've got all this afferent or ascending signals coming up from the heart. They, of course, they really stop off at the brainstem, but then there's a direct neural pathway, a very strong one, to a brain center called the thalamus, the very core of our brain. Thalamus has lots of roles. It's a sensory dis distribution center, for example, for all the sensory systems. So sensory gating, things like that are important. But it's also the brain center that's responsible for synchronizing the activity of the cortical neurons. It's literally what keeps them in sync. And this took a bunch of years to sort all this out, but in hindsight, it's actually pretty simple. So when we're in these stressed states, it throws our system into this desynchronized state. These erratic or chaotic heart rhythm patterns are being fed directly to the thalamus. They basically inhibit or interfere with the thalamus's ability to synchronize the electrical activity of the cortex. So it's a global effect. So when we're in that desynchronized state, our reaction times are impaired, coordination tasks, and so on. So the motor strips. But more importantly, so the easiest way to measure this in laboratory settings or experiments is things like reaction times, coordination tasks. However, the, the part of the brain that's most importantly affected is the frontal and prefrontal cortex areas. So, uh, in fact, one of your famous guys here from Stanford, Carl Prebum, coined the frontal cortex as the center of executive functions. That was, he's the guy that actually coined that term. So, one of the main things that we get from that is what's called foresight from our frontal areas. In other words, the ability to project into the future. And, you know,